In today's lecture, we are going to learn how one carbon allotrope can convert into another. So, in the previous lecture, what did you learn? You learned um, what are carbon allotropes and how do we classify them based on their hybridization states. We also learned that, like a periodic table, we can you can you can make a chart of carbon allotropes and you can always find things that are hybrid between two hybridization states. You know, hybrids of hybrids. So you can find many carbon. So the many uh, arrangements are possible with carbon atoms, and that is how you can have a wide range of carbon allotropes. Okay, now how do we make these carbon allotropes? Some of them are available in nature, yes, but also in nature, how are they formed? Are they always formed starting from an atom? Hmm? So you know that uh, we were talking about these red giant stars and we know that uh, we, we, uh, there you have fusion of helium and from uh, after that you have carbon atoms being formed. So now there you have actually a lot of carbon atoms available and those atoms then assemble together. They come together and then they form molecules such as fullerenes or they can also form um, any other type of carbon. So that is one way. That is the bottom up approach of the formation. You starting from the atom. But if you just have one allotrope Either, you know, uh, you, you may have it in nature also. Let's think of it that way. Let's say you have some diamond in nature. Is it possible that it will over time convert into, uh, into graphite or convert into any other form of carbon? Hmm. Similarly, is the other way around possible? Can you convert graphite into diamond? Hmm. So this is what we are going to learn in today's lecture. So we are also going to do some, um, you know, basic thermodynamic calculation, especially for this diamond to graphite conversion. The reason is also that this is something um, which has been studied a lot, diamond to graphite and also graphite to diamond conversion. These are the things that, because these were the two very well known forms of carbon and also these forms are available in bulk, they are available in nature. So their conversion also in the next lecture, we are going to learn about the phase diagram of carbon. And that also mainly talks about, uh, you know, diamond and graphite phases and of course certain liquid and you know, so non-solid phases as well. But um, these are the two uh, allotropes that have been studied very extensively, okay? So now forget about starting from the atoms. Now if you want to convert one allotrope into another, what are the two types of energies required? You, know, you need to provide some energy for sure. Hmm. Even um, uh, as you've learned in one of these uh, previous lectures, diamond is a metastable form of carbon. Metastable means that it is not the most stable form. Uh, naturally, at some point, it should convert into graphite. However, there is a there is an energy barrier. Hmm. So basically, you need to provide an activation energy, and once that is provided, then it will it will cross that barrier, and then it will then it will naturally uh, occur, and then it will convert into graphite. But we do know that we need to provide some external energy, activation energy. So there are two types of energies required now. Hmm. So now we need to understand why are these energies required at all. So first of all, you need to pull the atoms of diamond away from each other. Hmm. This is also a very stable crystal structure, by the way. Hmm. You also know diamond is the hardest material, uh, hardest technological material and whatnot. So you know that this is very strong bonding. It's not like diamond is very weakly, uh, you know, uh, attached to each other. Hmm. So now what you need to do is, first of all, you need to provide a certain energy to the diamond crystal to dissociate it, to make sure that you have now atoms away from each other. Only then they will, um, you know, only then they will form something else. So that is the energy number one. Energy number two would be then the energy of formation of graphite. Hmm. So you uh, you do know that term, it's a, you know, energy of formation is thermodynamic property. Hmm. And uh, how you, you take atoms that are at infinite distance from each other and you form one mole of, of a certain material, then that is the energy of formation of that material. Hmm. So you need energy of dissociation of allotrope 1, energy of formation of allotrope 2. Okay. Now, once this first allotrope dissociates, let's assume that we have diamond dissociated into uh, tiny little atoms which are at infinite distances from each other. This is like how you would have in a red giant star, let's say, you're very far from each other. And then you need to form now graphite. Hmm. So what will be that approach? That will be a bottom-up approach, right? Anything when you start uh, uh, from the atom scale. So you do it when you have smaller units and you make something, you assemble them, make something bigger. So that is going to be a bottom-up approach. However, 
when you have carbon in nature, do you always have, uh, you know, materials formed by bottom-up approach? Not necessarily. Sometimes you also have top-down approach. Top-down approach means you take something bigger and remove the material from it. Hmm. So what would be what would be a good example of that? Coal. Hmm. All the, the graphite that you mine. Hmm. Why? Because these things you know are formed from the organic materials. Hmm. So when you had a lot of organic materials, whether they were trees or animals or whatever, when they were buried uh, under the earth, then what happened? All the non-carbon atoms were dissociated and they left. And whatever you had left was was uh, uh, was your carbon. Now, of course, also in these uh, in this carbon material, the carbon atoms would have at some point come together and formed a bond. And you can say that huh, that is a bottom up uh, approach. But you can say it's a combination of both. Uh, top down and bottom up, but it's a, definitely you are removing some material. So you have uh, both types of materials uh, naturally uh, found um, uh, when it comes to carbon allotropes. Okay. Now, do we always need to start from this uh, single atom, individual atoms? Not necessarily. Again, if we are talking about converting one allotrope into another, maybe you don't need to completely break it apart. Maybe there is a certain distance between the atoms after which if you provide the energy then a crystal rearrangement takes place mm. so you don't completely break things apart so think of um, you know uh, for example lego blocks huh? or any any of these you know what children play with all these little blocks and you you um, assemble these blocks and make something mm. okay now if you make a house using these little blocks and now you want to make a completely different house mm. There are two options. Either you can, you can, you know, protect some parts of this house. You can just, uh, you know, remove few things and then rearrange them. Hmm. Or if the other house is completely, completely different, in that case, you may have to completely break every single uh, Lego block apart and then reorganize it. So these are both, both of these things are possible. So in some cases, for some um, allotropic conversion of carbon, you may have to completely break the uh, crystal apart. And in most cases, however, you can just do rearrangement of crystal. But for all of this, you need to provide energy. Hmm. And that energy is the activation energy. Hmm. Activation energy is a very, also, it's an interesting and, and very general term, right? Why do you not need to do this activation? Hmm. Activation energy can be to activate anything. Now, what is actually happening inside the material? Think about it. What is that activation energy or whatever energy we are providing? What is that energy actually doing? Hmm? So in the case of allotropic conversion, what is it doing? It is the energy that is used for breaking crystal number one and forming crystal number two. Hmm? So that is our activation energy in this particular case. Okay. Now let us do some thermodynamic calculations. We'll do both thermodynamic and kinetic calculations. So you know that for any chemical reaction to, to, uh, to take place, there are two thing, things. One is, uh, um, is uh, you know, some there are thermodynamic aspects of it and kinetic. Kinetic aspects will tell you how, what is the rate of the reaction? How fast is it? How slow is it? If it is possible or not? Hmm. Thermodynamic uh, calculations will tell you if from the, you, you take the initial state and the final, final state and you calculate the energy. So you don't really care about the path or the rate of the reaction, how it happens, is slow or faster, all these things you don't uh, factor into um, thermodynamic calculations, right? So that is, we are talking about state functions in most cases. Hmm. Okay, now you uh, probably recall uh, what is Gibbs free energy. Hmm. Okay, you know that when a material is formed, hmm, there is something also known as the energy of formation of this material. Energy of formation is defined as the change in the Gibbs free energy which is required for to form one mole of material. So one mole we have given, we have to define it, so we have given a unit. So for making one mole of the material, of course under standard pressure uh, temperature conditions because otherwise the things will change. So uh, on STP, now when you, when you form one mole of certain material, that is the energy of formation. Um, typically, when you are you're considering the energy formation, then you are thinking that, okay, you, you assume that the atoms were at infinite distances hmm, from each other because you don't start with any predefined arrangement already. So from zero, if you start, then you want to form one mole of graphite. That will be the energy of formation of graphite. Okay. Now, for graphite, 
because it is the most stable form of carbon, hmm, that is what carbon should naturally be in a way. Hmm, all carbon should in principle be graphite unless some other energy is provided. Hmm. So in that case, the uh, energy of formation of graphite at standard room temperature and end pressure is zero, hmm, zero kilojoule, kilojoule per mole. Hmm. But in the case of diamonds, that is not zero. It is, uh, it is a finite number. Hmm. Okay, so this energy is 2.9 kilojoule per mole in the case of diamond. Okay, so now let's do a little bit of calculation. Um, when you want to calculate the energy or gives free energy of a certain reaction, how do you do that? You take the products minus the reactants. So the energy of formation of the product minus the energy of formation of the reactant. This is very simple calculation. So here I have written delta G naught of, um, of graphite minus delta G naught of uh, of diamond that would give you the um, the converge the, the energy of this reaction hmm. delta G naught for this reaction okay so simply you have 0 minus 2.9 that would give you minus 2.9 kilojoule per mole okay negative energy now what does this mean when you have the delta G naught of a certain reaction that's negative that actually means it's a favorable reaction hmm when you have some negative energy of a certain reaction, that means that equilibrium actually favors this reaction, which is also, you know, uh, which is also obvious to us. If graphite is more stable, then it should be possible to form it, at least if we consider only the initial and final state. So we only consider diamond and graphite, then graphite is more stable. This is also clear from here. You have a negative energy of reaction. Okay, now calculate the equilibrium constant. Now, again, because it is STP, 298 Kelvin is the temperature. Now, this, what are we calculating here? We are calculating the rate of reaction. And now, uh, sorry, we are calculating the, uh, the reaction constant for this reaction. This is the formula for it. Hmm. E bar minus delta G naught of the reaction, which we have now calculated before, and RT, which is kind of a, a kinetic energy term. R is the universal gas constant, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. Okay, so now if you will do the calculations, I have not written all the steps here, but you will find some, some value approximately um, 3.22. It will be uh, E power a positive, positive number, 1.17 or something it comes to. Okay, so you will calculate that. This is 3.22. Now, there is another thing. Um, the, the, the conclusion that you derive from these kind of calculations is if, if your K is positive, the value of K is positive higher than 1, then you will um, uh, you will see that the, then the reaction is thermodynamically feasible. Hmm. In fact, uh, the higher it is, if K is much, much, much higher than uh, 1, then the reaction is faster. So depending on how, what is the, how, how large is the value of K, that tells you uh, the rate of your reaction. In principle, if it is a value higher than 1, if it is a positive number anyway, then it is a thermodynamically feasible reaction. Hmm, okay, so now we know that thermodynamically definitely it's feasible and as I mentioned again, if you just look at the, uh, you know, initial and final stage, this is very much possible. Now we will look at the kinetic aspects of this reaction. Hmm. Okay, so now taking some other um, aspects um, into consideration, okay. If we consider the kinetic aspects of the reaction, what we need to do is we need to now factor in the activation energy, which we have ignored till now. Till now, we were just thinking about the final and initial stages. Okay. So now what do we do? Um, what we can do is we can cal calculate the enthalpy of the reaction itself. Hmm. So now we are taking the full reaction into consideration. Okay. How do you do this calculation? This is very simple. Typically what you do um, that you can take the reaction of uh, diamond with oxygen and reaction of graphite with oxygen and these are some of the very well known reactions so we know a lot of details also we have experimental details of these reactions and what we can do is we can subtract them and then we can find the enthalpy of the of the diamond to graphite conversion reaction okay so let's quickly do that you have carbon in the form of graphite hmm. and when it reacts with oxygen it forms carbon dioxide and the enthalpy we know for this reaction is minus 394 kilojoule. Okay. Now, similarly, when you have carbon in the form of diamond and it forms carbon dioxide, then you also, again, know that what is the, uh, what is the value of the enthalpy of this reaction. Subtracting the two, you will get the conversion of diamond to graphite, the, the energy of this reaction is plus 2 kilojoule now. 
Mm. Now here, from here, you know that if this is a positive value, that means this is an endothermic reaction. Mm. Endothermic means um, it will, when if this reaction naturally takes place, then it will take heat from the uh, uh, from the uh, atmosphere. Mm. Okay, so this reaction then is naturally not feasible. Okay. Now, why is that? Again, we know this very well now that there is certain activation energy. Now, how can we do this? If we really want to convert graphite into diamond, uh, sorry, diamond into graphite, what can we do? We can provide this kind of activation energy. Activation energy can typically be provided by either heat or by catalysis. Hmm. And what do catalysts do? Hmm. They actually, they don't, you, it's wrong to say that you provide the activation energy. Huh. What catalysts do is they lower the value of the activation energy hmm. and in that case you can then uh, uh, have the reactions taking place either naturally or with, with very little bit of, uh, of external um, energy requirements. Okay. Hmm. So um, again as I mentioned before that you need to provide these, uh, the, the activation energy is required because you need to you need to uh, separate the diamond, diamond atoms and you need to bring the, uh, you know, atoms back to form diamond. And this energy, by the way, for diamond is pretty high, the separation of atoms. This energy is known as the cohesive energy hmm, in, in terms of uh, crystal structure. Hmm. For any crystal, the cohesive energy is the energy that is required to, to again, take the atoms apart to an infinite distance. And that energy for diamond is pretty high. It is 717 kilojoule per mole. So what, what this, this actually physically means that taking atoms apart from diamond is, is not easy. Hmm. That requires a lot of cohesive energy. So that is what that is the energy that you need to provide. Hmm. That is what we now call activation energy. Now, um, can we calculate this energy experimentally? You probably recall there is something called an Arrhenius equation. Hmm. The Arrhenius equation. And this equation looks something like this, which you will see it's very similar to what you also uh, previously saw. A lot of um, yeah, thermodynamic and kinetic calculations you will see when chemical reactions are taking place. They are they are pretty much in this form, e power minus x form. Hmm. So you will say, what is e power minus x? If you think of this function, e power minus uh, x is an exponential decay function. Hmm. What is decaying ex exponentially? You can, in, in some cases, not here, but in some cases, you will say the, the, uh, the concentration of the reactants uh, is, is uh, decaying exponentially. Hmm. Now, here, in this particular case, K is the reaction constant. So, it is the K that is exponentially decaying hmm. or the value of K. What does it mean that when a certain reaction takes place, initially, there, there is a certain time when it will be really, the rate of reaction will be very high. And that, that, that rate of reaction will then slowly uh, decay. It will never go to zero. Uh, that is what we, you know, it's an exponential decay. So we will never say that it goes to zero, but it becomes close to zero. Hmm. So the reaction, that is how you, uh, you, uh, you can actually understand many reactions. And most of the reactions are exponential decay reactions. Hmm. And for that, we have this uh, Arrhenius equation. Now, in the case of Arrhenius equation, so they, I have also uh, mentioned different forms. This uh, pre-exponential factor is a constant. Ea in this particular expression is the activation energy. So definitely, this is uh, where you actually now uh, factor in the, uh, the the activation energy for any reaction. And R and T, as I mentioned before, T because uh, temperature always increases the kinetic energy. If you uh, if you increase the temperature of any reaction, what will happen? Now the atoms and molecules will move faster. So that increases the kinetic energy. So RT is actually the term that takes care of the, the kinetic energy of, of your, um, the constituting um, atoms or molecules. Hmm. And uh, 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 R is the universal gas constant. So actually for any calculation, now you can, uh, well, the only thing when you're doing these kind of calculations, you need to just make sure that um, you are converting the units properly, huh? kilojoule to joule, and whatever is required if you're using um, gas constant in joule and so on. As such, Ea by Rt is a uh, is a dimensionless property, and that is why you have e bar minus x kind of uh, kind of function. Hmm. So k is also dimensionless in that case. Hmm. So this is the Arrhenius equation. From here, you can experimentally calculate. Hmm. I have not shown those calculations here, but you can experimentally calculate what is the activation energy. So what are the things that you can keep on changing the temperature, for example? Hmm. And then you can calculate the value of K. These are the two things you can find out experimentally. So if you know, uh, so the, 
if you, it's so and a would be the constant anyway for it's a characteristic of a certain reaction now if you keep on changing the value of t and the value of k you can experimentally note down you can observe then the only thing that is left is ea which is your variable that is the that is the value that you can calculate for any particular reaction here we have the diamond to graphite reaction so in this diagram so very very simple representation if you will see that you have diamond slightly higher energy hmm, and then you have graphite slightly lower energy however there is this energy barrier and this this energy hmm, between the diamond's natural state and the state where the diamond atoms will be far enough from each other that now they can form something else hmm. now they can form something else that energy is known as the activation energy and as i mentioned before what does an uh, uh, what does the catalyst do it lowers the value of of the activation energy so here with the red curve i have shown the lowered activation energy value and um, the blue one is for the for the standard value of activation energy okay now so i said that now diamond can be converted into graphite is it also possible to do it the other way around can we convert graphite into diamond then all of you whatever uh, you know pencils you have at home you can convert them into diamond jewelry it's not that people have not tried that mm, you're not the first one to think about it a lot of efforts in fact there in the 1980s um, mostly there was a lot of research which went on in, in making the um, artificial diamonds mm. and we have been successful also in making artificial diamonds the only thing is that those diamonds are not really of high quality high quality means also the um, in the case of diamond what is the quality one is the purity mm. purity you can still obtain mm. because um, if it is all elemental carbon purity is not that difficult mm. in fact sometimes people want to induce impurities to give you know different shades and colors to the diamond and so on so purity part is uh, still possible even crystal defects can be controlled to some extent but the point is that you cannot grow really big crystals you can only grow sort of micro scale crystals and you we've not been able to synthetically grow very large diamonds and and the work on uh, in this um, the, the work is still going on the second thing is also that you require such high energies for this particular reaction that in a way it's not worth it hmm. it's too expensive to get those tiny little um, diamond crystals hmm. and um, so this is why you however in principle scientifically it is possible to convert graphite into diamond the idea remains the same hmm. uh, of course you will now require much higher activation energy because now you're going from a lower energy state to a higher energy state however again if you can cross the activation energy barrier in principle it should be possible hmm. and then you can somehow induce another type of crystal formation in this particular case if you induce the formation of graphite uh, of diamond so it is possible to convert not just graphite but also certain other forms of carbon um there are some um, uh, we will come to it non graphitizing type of carbon there are many different types of carbon which people also curved carbon so these non graphitizing carbons actually co they contain a lot of curved carbon in them mm. so anyway these kind of carbon structures can also be converted into diamonds okay so um here however uh, as i mentioned so i have not now detailed all the other calculations uh, the thermodynamic calculations and so on you can actually do because using the same values whatever you're doing for graphite to diamond you can also do from for diamond to graphite and the other way around um because the numbers remain the same you now know the the enthalpy of reactions of oxidation and you also know um all other values that i have shown before the only thing is that the ca calculations will reverse so you will see that huh, um uh, thermodynamically also it's not feasible to convert graphite into diamond but there is a certain activation energy which you can provide and if yes then you can you can do so however now here as i mentioned this activation energy requires really um, you know extreme conditions you need 12 gigapascal uh, or higher pressures so these are approximate numbers hmm. and uh, you also need temperatures above 1700 kelvin hmm. uh, if you can increase the the temperature a little bit you can reduce the pressure but also in this case you always typically always require high pressure just temperature will not do Uh, in the case of uh, in the case of the uh, the the diamond to graphite conversion you could do it just with uh, using very high temperatures in this particular case you also require very high pressure hmm. because 
you need to provide a certain type of crystal structure and that crystal structure is not the natural form of carbon. Mm -hmm. So uh, to induce sp3 hybridization in the carbon atoms, you also require a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, then there are also some other methods called, uh, for example, shock treatment, electric arc tre uh, treatment. What is electric arc? You probably remember arc welding. Huh? So you create an electric arc. That also provides a sudden energy. Hmm. So electric arc or even laser treatment and, and all of these uh, things, they will actually provide very sudden high energy, which, uh, which forces the atoms to reorganize. Hmm. And also all of these methods that I mentioned here, they have to do, to, they have to be done in a very, very controlled fashion. Hmm. So even electric arc treatment, it's not just that any, you know, you cannot just do the electric, um, you know, arc welding of your graphite pencil and it will convert into diamond. That's, that, that doesn't work that way. All of these things need to be also typically in the presence of catalyst, you need to perform this reaction. So you can imagine that it's not easy to do it. However, it is possible to do it. Hmm. Okay, now these kind of diamonds are typically used in, in cutting tools. So they are not really used for jewelry applications as I mentioned that you, are, you have tiny crystals. However, their hardness is pretty good hmm. because they are uh, artificially uh, synthesized. Even if you have um, you know, certain impurity, you don't much care about that. Um, so these kind of diamonds, in fact, what you get nowadays, you can get very, um, very inexpensive diamond cutting tools. Hmm. Even uh, I have, I, I don't know, I, I could show it to you that there is, um, you know, something called diamond scriber. It's like, it looks like a pen, but the tip of that scriber is, is a tiny diamond. Hmm. And that is used for cutting silicon wafers, for example, in the clean room when you're doing microfabrication and so on. So these kind of, um, uh, of cutting tools, which are nowadays available uh, for a reasonable price, of course, you cannot have them, uh, you know, using the natural diamonds. Otherwise, they'd be much, much, much more expensive. So for these kind of things, we are using these um, artificial diamonds. Okay. Now, in the next lecture, as I mentioned, we are going to study something called the phase diagram. Phase diagram is something where um, you learn about different crystalline and amorphous uh, phases of carbon. Mm -hmm. And also liquid and vapor phases, when and how they are possible. Different Phases. Now, when um, I think in your other courses, you must have learned about phase diagram. You will always uh, learn about the iron carbon phase diagram, hmm. uh, which is not even iron carbon. It's mostly uh, you never go to 100% carbon in that diagram. You will start with, uh, you know, you stop at the cementite uh, phase. Never mind. That is a very important diagram for engineering applications. Hmm. But there you have two elements and there is... Um, Something different, so when you think about it, when you have two elements, then composition of these two ele elements, how much carbon, how much iron, uh, iron do you have, that becomes um, an axis of your phase diagram, it becomes an important parameter. Hmm. In fact, based on the composition, you study the rest of the, the properties. But if you have only an element, hmm, you are always talking about 100% 100, 100 carbon, there's nothing else mixed in there, then the phase diagram definitely looks slightly different. And this is what we are going to learn in the next lecture. Hmm. Okay, um, Okay. now we come to some other conversions. So if diamond graphite, graphite diamond is possible, then it should also be possible to convert, for example, graphite into, into fullerenes or curved carbons. Here I'm talking about fullerenes. I'm talking about the spheres. Hmm. Okay, the answer is yes, that is also possible. Again, graphite being the most stable form of, uh, of carbon, always whenever you want to convert graphite into something, you will need to provide a lot of energy. Okay, so it can be converted into fullerenes, yes, by again things like laser ablation or arc discharge, something similar that you do uh, for diamond huh? and um, electron beam irradiation as well. Hmm. Electron beam irradiation means you heat it with a beam of electrons huh? at high voltages. Hmm. So all of these things can actually, um, they can facilitate conversion of, of graphite into uh, fullerenes and how does this actually happen? Typically, when you want to convert graphite, you will first convert graphite into graphene. What does that mean? You will remove one layer. Hmm. So, removing layers is possible. Um, there are many methods. Um, we will we will talk about them in detail. Even you can just take the uh, you know scotch tape and place it on top of graphite and just peel it off. Even then, you can get get um, single sheets, which then you would call graphene. Hmm. So, you first remove the graphene sheets from graphite, hmm, typically, and then you subject those graphene sheets to very high energies. Hmm. So here uh, we are not doing what we were doing from uh, when we were doing this uh, graphite to diamond conversion, we were taking graphite crystal. 
and here we are taking a single graphite sheets. So basically, we are taking uh, graphene sheets, hmm. and then we are converting them. They, we provide them high energies because they're 2D structures, you know. And then you provide them high energy. They kind of they, anything actually. Um, you will see that whatever when you provide, if there are flat structures, then you suddenly provide them a lot of energy, heat, hmm, or or energy in any other form. They will typically tend to minimize their surface area. Hmm. which means that the flat sheets would typically want to convert into circular objects or spherical objects or curved objects. Hmm. So that is basically the principle here as well. Um, so, <clears throat> of course, because if you want to make fullerenes, you need to ensure that now there are pentagons, otherwise they, 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 this uh, thing will not happen. Hmm. Uh, the curvature will not be uh, the right curvature. So in that case, here it is important that you have this graphene sheet should break apart into smaller pieces. And then the hexagons should either convert it to pentagons or somehow you should induce them as defects. Hmm. So once you have sufficient number of pentagons, then depending on the number of these pentagons, you will have either curved carbon or you will have a complete fullerene. Hmm. So there is a there is a publication. I have uh, given this uh, reference here. Um, and I have also taken the image from there. So you can see how it works. And um, there are also energies. This, is, this was done by electron beam uh, irradiation, as I mentioned. So you see that now there are, um, you know, some pentagons being created at some point with certain energy that you provide. Mm. And these pentagons then lead to the curvature. And then this curvature becomes more and more and more. And at some point, it forms a stable structure, which is the fullerene structure. So the point is that allotropic conversion here also is possible. So in conclusion, allotropic conversion is possible, but... It depends if it's necessary or not. If you are doing manufacturing, then um, typically you will just start with one material or one type of allotrope, and you will see how to process them, and you will, uh, you know, you will figure out how to uh, manufacture something out of it. Typically, um, it's not necessary to do allotropic conversion. However, sometimes you, uh, you know, even if you don't want to, it happens. In certain cases, for example, uh, the disordered conversion uh, ca carbon, the conversion of it into graphite, uh, or the other way around, sometimes you want something which is very graphitic, but you cannot get it. Sometimes you have some amorphous regions and you provide a little bit of heat and it converts into graphite. So these kind of things, um, they happen. And uh, th this is uh, something that you need to understand. In principle, you will not go into complete allotropic uh, conversions when you're making something. Mm.